India's share of the world economy when England came to our shores was 23%. By the time we got our independence, it was down to 4%. Their industrialization drove our deindustrialization. For example, handloom weavers were driven to poverty. Our entire creative manufacturing sector took a big hit. If you look at uh, India historically, and if you wind back to the time before the British came in, India had about 38% of global trade. And at that time, Europe was uh, just about 30%. If you look at what happened then, was that the British systematically destroyed this industry. The industry was organized into small factories or karkanas. These karkanas were destroyed so that the manufacturing could shift to the mills in Manchester, Lancaster, and so on. After independence, this kind of craft production has still stayed in people's homes. So it's individual families largely pursuing this from their homes, which puts them at a big disadvantage. There is no aggregation of material, there is no access to capital, and their access to market is severely limited by the people that they can see and interact with directly. India has 40 to 60 million artisans who need to be organized and be made part of an ecosystem that will give them access to global markets. Here is an entrepreneur doing this for the first time ever. Welcome to the show on Entrepreneurs Transforming the World. Neelam and the team at Industry are pursuing a sustainable growth plan for the creative manufacturing sector. They are attempting to transform this highly unorganized sector into planned, digitally driven, producer-owned hubs. These enterprising hubs will collectively cater to rising global demand for beautifully handcrafted lifestyle products. So today when we say creative economy, what all does that include? These are people who weave cloth, they spin cotton, we've got uh, embroidery, We've got uh, product design, we've got metal, ceramic, terracotta. Got it. So it goes across a bunch of sectors. Traditionally, artisans created two types of art. Highly decorated masterpieces around temples, rituals and patrons, which fetched them acclaim, and general products which were needed in higher volumes and used in everyday life. With the market centered around art, food, home and fashion, while art has held its place with patrons, it's the everyday products that have struggled, even though they have a bigger share of the common man's wallet. This sector has inadequate finances, raw material, manpower, retail support and technology. And its growth rate is just 3% a year. The government, until recently, looked at craft as a sort of a sunset sector. It was almost like we will subsidize them until the last craftsman dies, and then we won't have to bother about this uh, industry. Today, I think there's a little bit of recognition, a little reluctant though, that crafts might be an answer to India's employment or unemployment uh, problems and so on. So government now is beginning to look at this a little more seriously. And uh, we as an organization have been sort of promoting the idea of creative manufacturing instead of calling it crafts. So let's be frank, uh, we've been trying to scale the sector now for so many years and I realized as long as we called it handicrafts and handloom, no one was going to look at it, right? It's, it's considered to be not a growing sector, mm -hmm. which is such a tragedy. When we say we're building an ecosystem, you know, what does that mean? So the ecosystem was built on the premise that unless artisans will earn far more mm. than they are traditionally earning, they, they won't do this work. They'll find something else to do. And also the ecosystem creation thing came out that you have to go more and more remote because there is a mass out there. So essentially, uh, we use a principle that we call distributed manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That China built manufacturing on 5,000 women coming into a plant. Okay. So we don't do that. Mm -hmm. We have 150 women at village level coming to a facility to work. Mm -hmm. But they are connected. So these are the spokes. Got it. And they are connected to a hub mm -hmm. through technology. Over the years, industry has successfully created three large producer collectives. 
one that's based in Madurai, Tamil Nadu, specializing in natural fiber. This collective supplies home accessories to global furniture giant IKEA and has over 2,000 producers. The second collective in Mandya, Karnataka focuses on fashion apparel and accessories and has over 4,000 producers. The third is a crochet cluster in Narsapur, Andhra Pradesh, which has 12,000 producers. This collective was built in partnership with the government of India. New collectives on leather and jewellery are on the cards, but these will be determined basis market demand in India and abroad. What's common across all the industry hubs is that the producers are primarily women. The distributed manufacturing process allows for smaller groups of artists to work in spokes at the village level. There are about 150 women at each of these spokes, digitally connected with the hubs. This decentralized production process betters participation of India's remote workforce and allows women to be employed close to their homes. Besides, the hub and spoke model is operationally cheaper as compared to large factories. Each hub will be at least 8 to 10 spokes. The spokes will be covered under a radius of 70 to 80 kilometers. Starting from sourcing of raw material, basically it comes from farmers and traders. There is a receiving inspection. Then the box can be segregated, then it's been sliced, and then it comes to the production area. Predominantly what will happen, there will be an apparel line and there will be a home line. Neelam, what got you interested in the creative economy? So I'm an industrial designer from NID, right? And uh, somewhere I think towards the end of my course, I had a huge ex existential crisis at NID. I started questioning the nature of work and the nature of how we use our time. I got some excellent advice from a senior at NID mm -hmm. who told me, Neelam, choose a craft where you can work with your hands. So I chose a craft called Lost Wax Metal Casting, okay. Dokra, where actually you make products in clay and then you wrap wax around it and then you cast and the metal takes place of the wax. Hugely intricate craft. I worked in Bastar, I worked in Chhattisgarh with very, very remote tribal artisans. I lived with them in their villages and frankly, the kind of uh, stuff I got from that period. You can see I'm still emotional about it. And why was it important to work with your hands? It's actually very interesting. My husband Jacob who works with me, he went and studied the lean Toyota production management system in Japan. Mm. And he found that, that it was a system devised by the craftspeople of Japan. Okay. Yeah, so there are huge connections, right? In what is happening in the industrial economy and how it borrowed from traditional practices. Right? So 150 years ago, production through hand was the only form of production. The yeah. industrial revolution is very recent. Mm. And then it's moved to mechanization. So how does funding and revenue work here? As social innovators, we understand that you need different kinds of finance for different pieces of the ecosystem. Industry utilizes three major revenue channels to reach its end customers. Global and Indian companies and intermediaries which include several retail brands. Partially producer-owned brands and B2B2C companies which sell industries products online. Industry is also trying to build a one-of-its-kind 100% producer-owned platform with direct brick-and-mortar retailing and a dedicated e-commerce website. Today, industry's funding comes from USAID, partnerships with organizations funded by various state governments, and from direct central government initiatives such as Skill India, Rural Livelihood Missions, and Handloomed and Handicraft Sector Schemes. So initially, to build scale, you can raise grants, but in the long term, you have to be self-sustainable, right? And you have to get to that competitive pricing. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why the professional management services that we provide at cooperative level, right? We are able to ensure that the delivery times to large B2B customers like IKEA are timely, mm -hmm. or the all the quality standards are adhered to, mm -hmm. right? and all the compliances that are required by global buyers are met. Right? So I treat all these as 
risk mitigation Got it. for the producer. Do you also use technology to reach more consumers? So that's obviously the dream. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all you need today is an e-commerce site mm -hmm. yeah, and you connect these production facilities and the artisans to their own labels or to their own markets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it has to be from producer to customer. Industry has created a unique 6C ecosystem that helps producers in every step of the manufacturing and retail journey. Here's breaking down this globally recognized model. Construct or professional management. Capacity or training. Creating or improving design. Channels or access to markets. Capital or better liquidity. And connect, in other words, digitally connecting artisans with wider markets. We've just done an, a social audit of our collective in Madurai. 96% of the women say they're happy to come to work. 33% of our women are the only earn, earn, earning members of their family. 54% of the women walk to work. 100% of them come from a five kilometer radius. They feel empowered. They say we have a community, you know, and no one is standing on the shoulders and saying, don't talk, don't do this, concentrate on your work. It's not a typical factory. That's Absolutely what you're not. I just got a message from my team from Madurai that Lakshmi in our collective has just bought a washing machine. And she's saying, I'm so happy because that way I get more time with my children. So for us, we have daily stories like this. So it's improvement of quality of life. We வேஸ்டாக்காமட்டுக்கு <laughs> For you personally, what's been most challenging, you know, in this space? I mean, I worked through the years my kids were growing up. That was tough. I always feel I never spent enough time with them. Mm -hmm. And what's been most rewarding? I think most rewarding is the fact that we are doing a global first. That we have a pathway out of poverty, which makes the poor economic actors. So that's been the biggest reward. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. And good luck in building collective-owned brands. Thank you, Lakshmi. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Neela.